job in the program industry. Um, I wrote down some notes myself, but uh, the coal crop, the number of coals born every year in the United States right now is 20,000 coals. Um, 30 years ago, it was 40,000 coals. So there's significantly less coals born now. And it's been a steady decline. Um, it's probably going to plateau soon, um, but uh, it follows a market. It's a very market oriented thing, a financial market. Um, but uh, um, in Kentucky, there were 10,000 10, foals born, roughly. So down in the Lexington for sales region, that accounts for half of the foals born in the entire country. And everything else is split out pretty well across the country. Um, California is the next biggest, but they're not, but they're quite small. New York had just under 2,000 2, foals born two years ago, the number is up two years ago. Um, and uh, California was just a little bit above that. Um, I think Pennsylvania was right below us, either that or Florida, I'm not sure. Um, but. Uh, uh, but it's pretty well spread out through the entire country. Um, but again, <coughs> half of them in Kentucky and the other half kind of spread out. Um, the U.S. imports about 2,000 2, thoroughbreds a year. And most of the import come, comes from Europe. Okay? And within Europe, they're coming from England, Ireland, and France. Those are really the three countries that we're buying bloodstock from. The term bloodstock it means thoroughbreds. And we export uh, under a thousand. And again, the vast majority of that goes back to Europe. Um, there's a significant number of those that go to South, South America. So um, as breeding stock, really. Um, and we do import from South America. We import from Australia and New Zealand. Um, if you're dealing with a young athlete, animal that's got to be at their best when they're two, three, and four years old. How does importing from Australia and New Zealand and Brazil affect that? Yeah, I mean, southern, southern hemisphere screws it up. You know, and uh, when you're you're, you're talking about a 9, 10, 11 year old horse, it doesn't make any difference. But if you're talking about a two year old horse, it matters if they're born in October or if they're born in May. You know, it's a very, it's a completely different animal. Um, so you'll see breeding stock move back and forth, but not so much um, the young horses um, from Northern Hemisphere to Southern Hemisphere. Um, a friend of mine did say he deals in high end horses and a lot of them that. A horse is an international commodity now. They have a value around the world, and they move around the world. You know, with airplanes, travel so easy now to move horses around that it's just amazing how much geography they can really cover. But that's kind of the amount of horses we're looking at in the U.S. Uh, I did look up like quarter horses or Morgans or things that I meant to to see how it compares. To what those industries are producing. I do know the most numerous horse in the U.S. is a quarter horse by far. You know, there's really no comparison there as far as numbers spread. Um, 10 billion, um, I don't want to miss, um, is the amount that is bet on race horses in the U.S., not in the world, but in the U.S. So $10 billion every year is wagered on race one way or another. These numbers to me aren't that impressive. You don't know what 20,000 horses looks like. Plenty of horses, but it is what it is. The number 10 billion to me is kind of impressive. So when you look at wagering, that's a big impact. That's a big impact. Um, on culture. <coughs> on culture. One billion is the purses paid out at the racetrack. Okay, so every time a horse runs in any race, at any point, it might be a very cheap race out of Finger Lakes, or it might be a very expensive race at Saratoga, that race carries a purse. And, uh, and the horses running the race earn, earn money 
running in networks. Uh, where does the purse money come from? Why does the racetrack pay the purse? Uh, not so much. The bets. Yeah, it all comes from from bet. It comes from this this money. So, um, so one thing about the thoroughbred industry is that people betting are paying for the industry. Okay, that's that's who generate the revenue that the whole industry runs on. Um, and uh, it's amazing how many people out there really just love. And some of them, you've probably been some of them. You go to Saratoga, the jockey's wearing pink silks, and you're like, yeah, it's the one, you know. Or you've got other folks who are doing mathematical formulas to bet. Both of them are equally successful or not successful, you know, but. Um, um, but there's a two dollar better, and then there's the very sophisticated better. There's folks that go when I, when I go to the track, I like going to Saratoga. I'll go like three times a year. Um, but uh, I take fifty to seventy five dollars, not much, and I spend it. You know, but I'm there for four hours, so I go to spend. If I if I spend seventy five dollars in four hours, and just have a really good time. That's cheap, you know. That's the, I don't expect to come back with any of it. Most of the time, I come back with with fifty or sixty bucks in my pocket. Every once in a while, I have two hundred dollars. Oftentimes, I'll have zero. I'll just lose and lose and lose. Right? When you win a little, you lose a little. Come away. But I go to spend it. I don't go to make money. I don't think I'm gonna get rich. And uh, but most most folks do that. They just say, I'm gonna go have a good time. It's the same as going to a casino or something. I don't go to Lowe's, but if you want to go there, you just go and have a good time and you spend and you spend spend money doing it. Um, hundred and seventy eight million of the purses in New York State. That's the first money available in New York State. There are four tracks in New York State. One is Finger Lakes, which is out by Rochester. It's the cheapest lowest end track in the state. Um, so the horses are less valued, they're running for less money. Um, and that runs from April 1st to December 1st. And, uh, and then there's three other tracks, Belmont, which is on the western end of Long Island, east, eastern end of Long Island, right? Not, not, not far from the bridges. Um, and then Aqueduct, which is right next to JFK, and then Sar Saratoga. Saratoga is a short meet, so in the New York Racing Association owns and runs those three tracks, so they're all connected to one institution. Um, Belmont um, runs in the fall. It's not winterized, so as the weather turns harsh, Aqueduct runs over the winter. In the spring, Belmont opens back back up again, and then in the summer, Sar Saratoga runs. And there isn't any one of those three that are running at the same time. There's a few gaps as they change. The population of horses exists mostly at Belmont Park. There is stabling at Aqueduct, and they stable there year-round as well, but it's a lot less stabling. Um, they ship back and forth between those two, two tracks. When they come up to Saratoga, um, there's trainers that come up from a, you know, around the entire country to come to Saratoga. Um, so the trainers in New York get some stalls in Saratoga, but not as much as they need. So they'll keep some horses still down at Belmont, and they'll have some horses at Saratoga, and when those horses at Belmont run, they just ship them the four hours up, and, and they run and they ship back. Um, the Saratoga opens up as a training center in May, and it stays as a training center from May through October, except for when the actual meet is running. So when they're actually running races there, there's nobody there except horses that are running in races. So the trainers at Belmont won't have enough stalls at Belmont, and they'll have overflow at Saratoga, May, June, you know, and then as the races start, they'll move their main string up there and they'll move their overflow back to Belmont. And they just go back. But those three tracks are kind of synergy. Um, Belmont runs a very high quality meet, especially in the fall, but also in the spring. Um, Saratoga is a little higher quality than that, one of the top two in the country, really, top three in the country. Um, and Aqueduct in the winter runs a more modest meet. You know, if you think about galloping a racehorse, 
being a jockey, exercising horses in the morning in Long Island next to JFK in January, it's not the most pleasant job in the world. It's pretty darn cold. So the big time stables follow the weather. So they go down to Florida for the winter and they race in Florida and then they come back. So the smaller stables stay and uh, it's kind of a ham sandwich kind of meat over at them. Um, but these are the purses for the year. The average race, average purse is 56,000 for the race. Now there's a huge, you know, variance there. You've got the Traverse for a million dollars, and you've got a $20,000 claimer. Um, so there's huge adjustments back and forth. But on average, you're talking about a lot of money. You know, you're talking about a lot of money. I've raced horses at Finger Lakes. The college has raced horses at Finger Lakes. So we used to have a thoroughbred program, and, um, and we raced horses at Finger Lakes when we had that program. Um, the horses paid for themselves. They were, they were cheap horses by that point, um, and they ran for anywhere from $3,000 to $10,000 claimers. Um, but as long as they ran once every three weeks, they paid their own bill. They didn't have to win to do it, um, but, uh, um, but they had to do well, and then we didn't get a, we didn't get a bill. Um, once you get to more expensive horses, they can run a little less but also they have the chance of running for a lot more money and they can put money in the bank, but there's the time that you can make. Um, but once again, the people that are paying the purses are the betters, right? Um, so they're enabling you to invest and, uh, and try to have fun in what you're doing and churn some money. Anyone who's in the thoroughbred business owning a racehorse, they realize it's not a business, it's a sport, really but it's a sport that's very expensive to play, so you need to do it in a professional way. Your horses earn money, you can reinvest in what you're doing. You couldn't afford to do it if you were just writing all the checks out and nothing was coming back. But if you do it in a professional way, oftentimes you can, uh, you can at least pay your bills and keep going. In the end, you're losing money, but you're having fun losing money. They sell, you ever hear the saying, it's the sizzle, not the steak? What does that mean? You're selling the sizzle, not the steak. Yeah, emotion. Everybody's heard that steak sizzle, right? And it makes you hungry, right? And sometimes you're really just for that. It could be bacon, you know, but uh, what people who own race horses in partnership or own them, they're doing it for the excitement they're doing it for the fun. They're doing it in a business-like manner so they can keep doing it, you know? Um, but nobody invests in racehorses thinking they're going to get rich. It doesn't work. Um, let's see. Five, uh, 500 yearlings are sold every year as New York breads that were bred in New York. And that's just sold as yield. So you can sell horses as weanlings or two-year-olds or whatever. But, um, the total number over the last few years is growing just a little bit, but it's 30, 33 million. So they're averaging 67,000 a year. Old. The median is 35,000. What's the difference between the average and the median? Just by definition. Wait, average, if you add them all up, you're going to divide by how much there is. So which way is this average skew? Higher than yeah, yeah, toward the expense. So again, you get a million dollar yearling that throw that adds to the average, but it throws off. You know, it, it makes it so that it seems a little deceptive. Half the horses sold for less than thirty-five thousand. Half the horses sold for more than thirty-five thousand. So that's a different number than saying I'm going to get sixty-seven thousand on average. Um, so, but still, the yearlings sell. And uh, um, in my experience, if you pay a stud fee of $5,000 to breed to a stallion, you get a full. If you sell a yearling for $20,000 in the fall of its yearling year, you break even. Um, so those kind of numbers play out. 
Stud fees get a lot more expensive than that, um, but, uh, but that's not how much it costs to raise it and get it to that point. That $33 million, is that just in New York? Yes. Just in New York? Total or the New York rates sold? And it may be some New York rates that are sold in Kentucky, or it may not. I'm not really sure. I didn't drill, drill down on the numbers. But that's kind of what they're producing as a whole, whole set of actions in New York rates of banking. So it just gives you a sense of the scope, but one of the things is um, it's an expensive thing to do. Animals are expensive. I don't care what you're doing. Um, I compare horses much more so to the dairy industry than I do to the other livestock industries. To me, the dairy industry, you have to spend money and a lot of money to make money. You know, and uh, it's a high input business. The livestock industries, you're really controlling costs. You know, you're using ground, you're managing grass, you're controlling your costs. You still have to spend money, um, but it's a little bit different how it's approached, where with the horses it's a little harder in that um, uh, you have to do a little more what the dairy industry does in that you have to put a lot of inputs in and uh, raises up your costs and then you're hoping to make something at the top, you know, so um, a little more comparable. The way the horse industry works, the, uh, the thoroughbred industry is you're going to breed the mares on the farm. Right? It is live cover. The stallion has to physically breed the mare. Um, there is no ship semen. There is no artificial insemination. Actually, live cover. Um, I've shipped mares to Kentucky to be bred. Very often, you're breeding them on their 30-day heat. So if that mare fold out, 30 days later they're getting bred. You try to wait a week and a half, two weeks. While that foal's growing a little bit stronger, you put the mare on the truck to Kentucky. She goes down there and gets bred. She stays there until she's confirmed in full, like 60 days in full, at least 30, 45, 60, and then comes back here. Um, or they can just be bred here, but, uh, but they've got to move around. In other words, they've got to be where the stallion is. Um, but you're raising them on the farm, and uh, um, one of the I think attributes to horse farming is that you're raising an athlete. And um, again, to say, well, it's not really comparable to livestock in that um, livestock, you're, you're, you're raising a food product and you really don't want that food product to move around a lot. You know, it's got to move around enough to be healthy, but I don't think you want your cattle galloping around the field all the time. You know, it's probably not what you're looking for. So um, the horses have to move. They have to move over lots of ground. They can't be, they can't, like you would never ro rotationally graze horses because, yeah, you're yielding that grass tremendously more efficiently, but you're locking those horses into a smaller space and then moving them to a smaller space. So you're using your grass, but you're not raising an athlete that way. So, um, so as a horse farmer, you have to strategize managing your fields and most of the time you do it by rotating livestock through ahead of the horses. Um, it helps with parasites, it helps with grass management, um, but the horses are gonna have too much to eat, in other words. They're gonna be on too much ground and you're not gonna be able to make it efficient. But the farms are, are large, some of them, they can be small, um, but it's like raising anything else. It's a very, very nice life for the horse, you know, um, and uh, uh, you treat them like horses. They're outside far more than they're inside. Um, it's not like a riding barn or horse show barn where you've got to cater to the clients and um, and everything has to be you know paved and nice for the clients. You treat them like animals. They're out. Um, they go from the farm, and you can sell thoroughbreds as weanlings or yearlings or two-year-olds in training um, before they get to the track. The vast majority of horses sell as yearlings. So that they sell the other way but the vast majority sell, sell as yearlings. Um, and August is early, they'll sell August through October as yearlings in different sales. Um, so you're looking at a year and a half old, um, most of them. Um, after they're bought as yearlings, the breeder's out of it, right? They've just bred, they've, they've raised that horse and they, hopefully they made a profit. Um, the horse then has to go somewhere warm because it's gonna start training. So nowadays it's mostly Florida where they're going, Ocala region, Northern Florida. 
Um, South Carolina was the traditional place to go. Aiken and Camden and Columbia really were the three areas, but especially Aiken and Camden. And they're still very, very busy. Um, but uh, you want the horse where the weather's going to be good and the footing is going to be good. And the, the, uh, the yearlings start under saddle typically by October, um, mid-September or October. And um, by May, most of them, but not all of them, have then shipped north again to whatever racetrack they're going to. So an owner buys the horse, probably through an agent or through a trainer. And through the agent and trainer, they have contacts, they send the horse down south, it gets started in training. And then in the springtime, the trainer receives the two-year-old wherever, wherever they are. Um, the, the vast majority of horses don't run as two-year-olds. They don't actually race as two-year-olds, but the vast majority are in training as two-year-olds. Um, so um, it is, the two-year-old is, is a lot of racing, but um, most of them, more than not, don't start until they're three. And the young ones, the precocious ones, the ones that are growing up really fast and really strong, you just go on with them. The ones that are kind of goofy, you wait on them a little bit. But uh, I'm sure you all played sports in high school and you saw folks that were great in Little League. And by the end of their high school year, they weren't as good. And by the end of their college year, they were just average. You know, and there were other players that actually improved through their time span. So some folks are good early. Some folks are better a little bit with, with a little more time. Somebody does both, but you're, those things are going on. Um, and then the big question is what happens when they're done racing? Right? What happens when they're done racing? Um, and I'm not gonna bore you with all the different levels of racing because it's kind of boringly complicated, but um, um, there are, the highest races are called stakes races and Higher than that are graded stakes races. So there's grade one, two, and three stakes races, and then there are just stakes races. Um, obviously, the Kentucky Derby and stuff like that are grade one stakes races. Um, they carry the, basically the more money for the higher quality. Allowance races are kind of your everyday racehorse, um, and uh, they're written as to say, well, has a horse never won a race? He might have raced, it might be his first race, it might be his 10th race, but if he never won a race, that horse is called a maiden. Okay, so there are maiden races, horse restricted to horses who haven't won. Um, once they win, the, the allowance races are for horses who haven't won anything but a maiden race. And then for horses that won their maiden, their first allowance, but haven't won another allowance. You know, So they kind of go that way. Um, the horses that can't quite stay in those groups, they have to drop down to lesser company, slower horses, and they get entered in claiming races. And a claiming race means that the way to separate, instead of saying, well, you just haven't won two races yet, they'll say, well, that's not a great separation because they could be fairly high quality horses in there. Let's say the claiming price is $30,000. Any, anybody entering the horse in the race that horse can be claimed for $30,000. So if you feel that's a fair value for your horse, it all works out, you know. Um, some folks try to steal the races and enter their horse a little lower without somebody realizing the value of the horse, but there are folks who make their living just claiming horses and racing them. They get horses claimed often, but those are the lower level races. Um, what happens is even the high quality horses, like uh, Artie Loves to Party, the police horse up at the barn. He was a nice race horse. I think he earned like 230,000 or something. In his early part of his career, he was stakes placed, and he won some allowance races. Um, but then what happens is they get wear and tear in their joints, right? So they're not gonna be quite as fast. And um, uh, so he dropped into a $20,000 claimer. I think he finished up fairly high. He was a $15,000 claimer. <coughs> and uh, he won his last three races before he retired. Um, and he changed hands a lot. He changed hands. People claimed him. He went to a new trainer. They had him for three or four months. Somebody claimed he went to a new trainer. He was just very useful at that level. But the problem is, to me, is that the high quality horses, I say you get a good horse and it's a nice horse and it's winning nice races. They're probably not going to do that forever. 
and as they lose a step, they drop down in price. Someone else buys them and races them. The only thing that person has invested in that horse is what they bought the horse for, right? And then as the horse loses a few more steps, somebody else buys it for less money, and that's all they've got invested in the horse. So there's a lot of horses that might have won nice allowance races or were stakes placed that might be, as four and five year olds, claim for $10,000. When that claiming trainer now owns that horse, he's only invested ten thousand dollars. You know, so he wants to get out eventually from the horse, and so he might eventually maybe make a little money, maybe not, but eventually the horse drops down to five. Eventually the person that is actually training the horse is very little invested in it. And uh, so when that horse leaves to them, it's not the same thing. It's not like you bred the horse, it's not like you train the horse throughout his first year. It's not like you invested all that money to buy it, send it to the training center, send it to the track. They're in, they're in at the end, which is a small investment. <coughs> and it's also very hard to keep track of the horses as they go through the whole process. As a breeder, I've tried to keep track of all the foals and it's very hard to do. If they race, you can get an alert that they're racing. But where they are and what they're doing, unless they actually race, it's very hard to do that. Um, and if you did want to claim a horse yourself and take it off the racetrack, the only person who can claim a horse is an owner who has raced a horse at that meet. You can't just go to a strange track and claim a horse. In other words, you've got to already have a horse there, already have a horse running to claim another one. So that gets a little tricky. I had a filly that I had bred and sold very well. Eventually she, she went to West Virginia she was racing for a $5,000 tag, claiming tag. I said, I'd like to claim that horse, just bring her home. You know, I made money on that horse, I wanted to bring her home. I couldn't get her claimed um, because I had to find someone who would claim her for me. And, uh, and they get a little tricky when you're going around the rules to claim a horse. They, don't, they see that coming, the racing regulations see it coming. So I wanted to get that horse home as it was I couldn't get her claimed, and then I lost track of her, and she was just gone. So, um, so that that can become a frustration. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my experience, and then just open it up to discussion and questions, and then um, so you guys can jump in there. Um, I didn't have any interest in racehorses uh, when I was in college and pre-college. No interest at all. Um, I always liked thoroughbreds. To me, I liked that breed. Um, and uh, my saying is, and I've had it forever, that um, I really, I'm very open to kinds of horses, breeds of horses, gender, color, everything, and that I um, would be involved in any horse, um, whatever they are, as long as, and it's just a small parameter, as long as it's a thoroughbred, plain bay, no white markings, 15.3 to 16.2. Not smaller, not bigger. Okay. Gelding. Okay. As long as it fits that, I'm wide open. Very open minded <laughs> to whatever it is. So, um, but the only reason I went out of college, I went to work on a thoroughbred breeding farm in New York, Orange County, because there was a salary, there was housing, and there was health insurance. That was the only reason. I didn't know anything about breeding horses, um, and I didn't know anything about racing. Um, and uh, I wanted to be a three-day event rider, and I was doing some of that, but I couldn't make a living doing that. You know, everybody wants to get you, and they'll feed you, and you work hard, and they'll give you riding lessons, but they don't pay you. So I went down to this breeding farm. It had 200 horses total on it, including everything. Um, and, uh, and I just started to learn. So what we did was, um, uh, they stood stallions, and uh, they had a very large mare population. Um, and uh, we fold out, and then in the in the summer you would prep yearlings for sale. In the fall you would break yearlings. You'd start in September on the farm. We had a little quarter mile track on the farm. They all had to be the same point by Christmas or before Christmas, um, jogging, cantering around the racetrack, and then they were sent to uh, the Carolinas. Uh, from that point, and then they ended up at the racetrack. So I handled stallions, I fold mares, I prepped yearlings, 
we sold a lot of yearlings. We sold mares lots of different places. We sold uh, in Toronto, in Kentucky, in New York, of course. Maryland is a major place to sell New York horses, and of course, down in Florida. Um, and we sold at all different levels. So it was a lot of miles over, really. I was there about three years. Um, I decided I might want to stay in the industry because I could see where you could actually have a career. So, but the trainer said, you know, if I'm going to stay, you know, you're, you're breeding and you're producing a product and I don't really know what the product does, really. I mean, I can watch the races, but I don't know what the product does. And I really need to spend time on the racetrack I had already, the farm had the mares, the fillies that they wanted to keep and make into brood mares, they would race themselves. So the farm already had a dozen horses in training. <coughs> and on my day off seven or eight times, I'd go down to Belmont and I'd hang out in that shed row that trained for our horses. Um, and it was a strange environment. I, um, I didn't know what to expect. Um, I'd heard the worst about the racetrack God, it's got to be a horrible place. But I went down, I got access to the racetrack. The trainer was from Panama, and he's an older gentleman. And the crew that he had with him, which were six or eight people, had come with him from Panama. And um, they had been with him for 15, 20 years, all of them. So it was the same crew. And they were the nicest people in the world. They really were, uh, really, they took very good care of the horses. I learned a little bit about racing. They spoke nothing but Spanish. So it was a little awkward, um, but uh, but they really did a nice job. Unfortunately, they had pretty mediocre horses to train, um, but they did what they could. But I did notice it was kind of a big family that had been together for a long time, and I didn't really expect that. I expected something very different. Um, when I actually went to the track, I went to work for a very good trainer, and at that time, a trainer could have a maximum of 30 stalls, and there was only two or three trainers in the country that had strings of horses across the country. Wayne Lucas had horses at Belmont, Churchill Downs in Kentucky, Santa Anita in California, and as many as you could have at all those places. There's only two or three of those folks. Everyone else worked out at one racetrack in one barn. So you could just look up and down the shed row and everybody's there. The trainers there, two assistant trainers, a groom for every three horses, hot walker for every six horses, exercise rider typically for every four, five, or six horses, um, and everyone's on salary. And uh, um, I started grooming for him, and uh, when a horse, when a, what, what a racehorse does is you tack it up in the morning for its set, and the trainer tries not to have more than one horse from a groom go out in a set, so you're grooming three, three horses, and um, and uh, they give the exercise rider leg up, they go gallop the horse, they come back, hot walker takes it, they cool the horse out after they give it a bath, and the next set is going out, so you're doing that. Um, I, had, I started to groom, I was the newest, the next newest groom in that shed row, had been there for 10 years. So, uh, and I had to wait to get my job from, it's like August to January to actually start, because that was when a groom was leaving. Um, and uh, eventually I was one of the exercise riders instead of a groom. Um, we were in New York most of the time. For the winter, um, we went to Hot Springs, Arkansas, which is really a great place to be. Trees, lakes, really a nice place to race from January to May. And then we're back in New York, and then he took horses to Saratoga. I stayed at Belmont. I looked after the ones that were at Belmont, which were the ones that were not gonna run in Saratoga. And then those horses ran at Monmouth Park in New Jersey. That was a short ship down there. And that's what I did for him while they were up in Saratoga. Um, one of the things I found there was that we really, they took exceptionally good care of the horses. Uh, the train was very, very sharp. Um, and uh, everyone just did a good job. What happens is in the old days, which still happens today, but nowhere near as much, if you're a groom, you groom three horses. When that horse enters your stall, say it's a two-year-old in the spring, it, it enters your, your stall, the trainer already has a sense of the value of the horse as it comes up from the south. The longer you've been there, the better groom you are, the better horse you get when you have an opening. 
if you don't have an opening, you don't get a horse, right? If you've already got three. But if one of your horses is retired, you have an opening, and the longer you are, the better horse you get. You groom that horse until the end of its career, no matter what happens. And uh, you get one to two percent of the horse's earnings. So the better horse you have, the more earnings you have. The better care you give, the more earnings you have. So what I found is we were grooming, you did talk to the assistant trainer. He did the nitty gritty. But as you brought your horse out for the exercise rider, the trainer's standing right there. He says, how's your horse this morning? He would ask you questions about your horse. It's your horse. Now, so, and at that time, more so than today, there were grooms that had groomed on the racetrack their whole life. And they were very, they were very professional. They knew what they were doing. They picked up on things before anybody else did, the value of the grooms. And that was our job, to pick up on things because we're the ones with our hands on the horse all the time. And uh, um, so it was kind of interesting because you were into the horse's career. And very often, if you trained, if you groomed a horse and there was, it was from a breeder that breeds to race, if you had a sibling come up related to that horse, that went into your stall. So you followed families over the years too. Um, so. The first day on the racetrack, though, I didn't know what was going on. I started out hot walking for a few weeks before I groomed. I didn't know the procedure in the race. I didn't know any of the horses. The first set that went out, one of the horses that went out was going to breeze. A race horse will trot and canter, slow gallop, <coughs> two miles a day, approximately. And, uh, um, but every four or five days or once a week or when they want to, they're gonna go a shorter distance faster. So they're gonna breeze. They're gonna breeze a half mile and go somewhat near racing speed for a short distance. And that's the way they train them. Long, slow distance and a short sprint. Long, slow distance and a short sprint. And you space out the short sprints. And when the exercise rider is asked to do that, the trainer gives them a time. So you don't go, it's not like the movies where somebody has a stopwatch and said, oh my God, that was really fast. <laughs> you know, they tell you, do a half in 48, do a half, 50, and that's what you do. You never go faster than they tell you. And the trainer needs to know the horse, he needs to know what the horse needs, but you don't go as fast as the horse can go. But a colt that had been there, he was five years old, came in as, as a young two-year-old, had won great at stakes, and won a lot of money and was the barn favorite. He went out to Greece to get ready for his last race a few days later, and then he was going to stuck. Well, he went out to Greece and he broke down. So all I see is the exercise rider walking to the shed row, carrying the tack, and he's full of blood. Some of it his, some of it the horses. And the groom for that horse was like six foot five. He was like super, super tall. He walked kind of funny, and uh, and he was all of 50, um, very scruffy, nice guy. He was an alcoholic. Um, the rule was you could not drink in the shed row. Um, he kept a bottle hidden anyway, but, um, but he really was the best groom. And uh, he was a very good groom. He had done it all his life, but he was an older gentleman and an alcoholic. And, um, but when that exercise rider walked in, um, the groom looked at him and he knew exactly what had happened. The groom, 50 year old guy, sat down in a hay bale, cried like a baby, literally, for 20 minutes. And then just got up, he had his little spot to live there and just left for the afternoon. Somebody else did his stuff. But I was, I was kind of overwhelmed. It was like, one, I don't know what's going on. And two, I knew horses got hurt. I had never, I didn't see it. I saw the aftermath of it. Um, so I thought, well, maybe racing is horrible. But then I saw the lifetime groom sit down on hay bale and cry, you know? So it's like, information doesn't gel, you know? It's, it's, it's not gel, you didn't know what to do. Um, people at the, ra the racetrack are very superstitious. And uh, one of the grooms looked at me and said, well, I hope that's not gonna be our luck now that you're here. You know, I was the only thing that changed that day. It was I walked in, so. But they actually were nice people, but I think he meant it. He was like, something's changed. You're the new guy. That horse broke, you know. Not that it was my fault. They're just superstitious. But, but I mean, again, you get incongruent information, you know, about it, which is what I tried to do in your articles, is to say, here's all the horrible things, but here's the people 
and uh, you look at it both ways. Um, I went from the racetrack, which I actually loved that job. It was really just a fabulous job. And, um, but it was different in those days. It's very different today. Today, there are many mega trainers that have horses. The same person who's gonna have 30 at Belmont has 80 at Saratoga as, as Overage. And then they've got horses at Mammoth and horses at Santa Anita. So they've got horses all over the country. They might be training 300 horses. Um, so it's, they can't get enough help, and uh, the horses move around across the country. It's really not the same um, as it was before. Um, some of the challenges, um, right away, that we definitely want to talk about, um, but you're, you're taking a young, immature athlete, and you're really tightening the screws. Right? You're asking it to do more than it probably should do, and they get hurt. You know, soft tissue injuries, torn ligaments and tendons, um, they get joint issues, and they break legs, and they break bones. I mean, that happens, you know? It's not the only horse area that that happens to. The soft tissue injuries, the joint injuries, they happen in the barn. If somebody tears a tendon or something, you know it the next morning. You know, it's the broken bones that you see that are traumatic. But there are injuries that happen that don't show up till the next day. So, um, the medication the horses get, you're, you're training an athlete. Okay? Uh, football players, not baseball players, because they run really slowly. But other than baseball players, soccer players, you know, they need athletic trainers, right? And you go over to Matt Road any day of the week especially soccer girls. They're in there with this freaking big purple knee sitting up with ice on it, you know. So so they're athletes. So you have to treat them like athletes and you need medication for them to help them, especially from an anti-inflammatory standpoint. But then there's medication that dulls the pain. So that can become an issue. Okay? Um, and then lots of horses are going to be done. What do you do with them? The nice fillies who ran well, that are well bred, they go back to the farm and they start the cycle all over again. The geldings, what do you what do you do? There's retraining processes, things like that, but there's certainly a whole lot of issues. Um, I wanted to say something before I just open the floor right up. When I was at the track, they, they'll say to me, um, "You were at the racetrack. You must know a lot about lameness." And I don't, you know, I've learned it through my lifetime. I didn't learn at the racetrack. As far as the trainer was concerned, he needed 30 sound fit horses to keep earning a living, right? So he had another 10 down in Camden in South Carolina that needed rest. And they're at different stages of taking their, their time. And as a horse of the 30 needed rest, instead of nursing that along, blocking pain and letting the horse go downhill, he just sent it to South Carolina and one of the ones that was getting ready came up. He only had 30 stalls. So there very often there's a few down there that really could be up at Belmont. It's just there wasn't a spot for them. So as soon as a horse needed a little time, they went south. So I said, well, you know how you take care of soreness, you send them to Camden and four months later they come back up again. You know, so, and they weren't doing magic down there. They're doing a lot of cold water and just time, you know, just time. And uh, um, the trainers that didn't have a depth of good horses, they don't want to see the horse leave the stall. And sometimes if a horse leaves, it doesn't come back to you. It goes back to a different trainer. So they try to nurse the horse along. And if the owners aren't smart about it and don't have the long plan, they want to do cheap things and quick things as well. And the vets play right along. The vets, the, if something is done medication-wise or inappropriate-wise from the care of the horse, a veterinarian is part of that. They, trainers don't have meds, they can't have needles. So they getting all everything from the vet. So as you talk about issues going on, it's not a matter of having a bunch of doctors in charge. They're the ones actually selling the drugs. So, um, but the trainer I work for, you just had good quality horses, fit and happy. And as soon as they were a little sore, as soon as things weren't going right, 
Um, one horse that I groomed at first and then galloped, he got very sore through his top line. Very, very solid in his legs. Just sore through his muscles in his top line. And it compromised him a bit. And he was hard to ride. He wanted to run off all the time. An exercise rider's job is to get the horse to relax and gallop. Well, they're training on the Long Island Expressway, basically. Everybody's training in the same place. So while your horse is trying to relax, four people are flying by you. So he would just set into the bridle, and he would pull, and he was very hard to get to relax. Horse just pulls on you all the time, their back gets sore. You know, so because he couldn't really relax while his back got sore, then there was a point where it was hard to keep him as fat as you wanted to. He was getting just a little bit thick looking into a little bit too racy. So that's when he said, ah, send him south. You know, send him south, coat got slightly dull. You know, the horse just wasn't doing well. The horse was sound, you know. So we sent him south, another horse came up. That horse came back like nine months later, really, and had a healthier career again for a while. But, um, so, but there's not, my wife was there and she actually worked with a vet for a while. She went around the whole racetrack and she was like, my God, you're not going to believe what's out there. You know, there's everything. You know, there's absolutely everything from good horsemanship to bad and everything in between. The trainer I worked for, I learned a lot from. And um, he was uh, probably the best horseman I've been around. I probably learned the most from him. I left. I went to Kentucky. I worked on a farm, bred very nice horses, but they also had some horses at Keeneland. So I galloped a couple sets first thing, and then I went to the farm. That was a great experience. Then I came to New York for went in with my father and brother. We had a hunter jumper, hunter jumper three day event barn for a while, and then I moved to Colts. So, um, but that's my how. All right. Questions, comments, discussion. I just thought it was helpful to give you sense. So the horses you picked, the, the guy or the trainer that you picked, what horses Fractured his pastor. If you ever go to the uh, Saratoga, if you go to the Racing Museum, Hall of Fame Racing, it's a really nice museum. But in there, in one room, it has some stats on the wall about how fast the course goes, how much pressure it puts on their legs, and at what pounds of pressure does bone break. They put tremendous amounts of pressure on their legs. I'm sure hum, human runners do too. Um, but at some point, the bone's going to break. So um, if the surface isn't quite right, if that horse lands a little bit by one side of his foot, sends the pressure up, you can get a, a fracture. You know. Um, so yeah, that was a fracture right on the track. They euthanized. They picked the horse up in the ambulance, and then they euthanized him. That's the only injury we had in three years when I was there, actually. Um, so, uh, it, uh, but again, we kind of stopped before the injuries happened. What well, did you like more? Did you like the training aspect or the breeding aspect? I liked the breeding aspect because what I wanted to do was have a family, go to a nice school, live where I saw grass, and just have a nice job. You know, and on these breeding farms, they have little ranch homes that you're in, you know, so it's a really nice setting. Um, I like that aspect of breeding horses as farming. It's dull, it's dull, but, uh, but you're living in a nice place. Um, I liked the racetrack, um, and I would have stayed there longer, except that where it was. You know, you have to put the racetrack near the people, and I don't like to be around a lot of people. So if you're in this urban environment, you don't really want to be there. So. At that particular trainer, again, you're seeing horses through their entire career. So I rode the same horses every day. And you're riding the same horses through their career. And, uh, um, and that's kind of fun. And then, you know, I didn't get a chance. But then you're riding siblings to those horses. And um, you're seeing everything go. So. Trainers, and it, it's, there was a good article about a groom this right during August. Um, there are trainers that still stay to that model. They want to see all the horses they have. And when they do that, then they have more horses installed, and they're right there, 
and they have helped the state for them a long time. It's the trainers that um, that have the biggest issue. That you know, once 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 they're there, the same trainer that's looking at 30 horses at Belmont, he's got 100 in Saratoga during the off season. There's two assistants up there. They've got horses at Monmouth in the summer. They've got Church of Bass assistants in each place, and they're flying around. They can't get enough help. So the help just comes in and out. And uh, it's mostly, as that has changed, it's mostly Latin American help um, and uh, uh, Spanish help in one way or another. Um, and many of them are very well skilled. Some of them are not. And uh, it's just the sheer numbers of people they need makes it hard. Thing. you're hoping that the horse gets you know four or five years old and a little easier but again they've stepped down the ranks um, oftentimes by that point and that's very often it's the ones that stop a little earlier that are a little harder um, but uh, well, how you find that retirement you know where they go after that sort of stuff that's tough. most rules at most racetracks I don't know one that doesn't as a rule, if the horse cannot be sold to a buyer, that's going to take the horse to an auction. You know, which is then going to go to the kill count. So um, they can't do that. If you break the rules, you lose your license at that track. There are folks who try to break the rules, but uh, but that doesn't mean they don't get there eventually. But they can't go directly, directly there. What age is it? Is it the family rules? There's six, seven, eight-year-old horses running, but um, typically speaking, um, yeah, they're, again, most don't start as two, but a lot do, and uh, again, three, four, five are their real genuine years, and then the ones that are there, six and seven, you know, they're the old timers. You know, and as a regular rider, you're looking at six and seven-year-old horses as, you know, early middle aged adult horses. Not where I worked, no. Um, I was amazed that anything I brought up to the trainer, he already knew. You know, I mean, you sit at Belmont Park, it's a mile and a half of ground. He's sitting on a stock horse and uh, watching his horses train. And uh, as I came back, he said, you know, he forges a bit, you know, as we try, you know, not as you can. Or, and, uh, um, and he just said, yeah, I know. You know, and I said, how do you hear that? mile away from that. But they didn't miss anything, really. Um, he didn't miss anything. But I've seen trainers stay in the barn, and they're, they're just businessmen, and they send the horses out, you know. Uh, but yeah, not not where I worked. Uh, everything, you just try to do the best care possible. And it wasn't complicated. Uh, it, uh, uh, we fed oats and sweet pea, uh, some corn oil, and there were no meds. Kind, really. Um, um, how did you handle like reply to those to people who thought it was like the worst thing ever? Like, do you ever have people that were like, oh, why are you here? Like the negative parts of it. I much much later, um, I've had people say, "Oh my God, horses die racing. Why are you, why are you getting involved in that?" You know, and the thing is, you can't horses die racing. You know. And uh, you want to blame something, but the reality of it is very often, it's just an accident. But they die, you know. If you're a dressage rider and you trot down that center line to halt that X, the horse does not break his knee. You know, I've never actually seen that happen. So, and very often in the other sports, horses get injured a lot, but they don't fracture their leg. You know, their career might be over. They might go to the kill, the, the killers, you know, but they don't have that horrific um, fractures. So, again, it makes you question what's going on. You know, and the question is, well, do you wait to start them out? Will that help? You know. So after you know, um, the first one, the lady mentioned horse slaughter. What is your opinion on that? My opinion on slaughter, and it's just my opinion. I wouldn't try to convince anybody else, but. Um, I haven't been to Holland, Lynn Dunn's been to Holland, and she told me about it, and in Holland, there is a slaughterhouse 
in every county, basically. You're not gonna drive more than 20, 25 minutes. So when your horse needs to be euthanized, if it's gotten healthcare meds because it's been sick, it has a health passport with it. You start that out in the beginning. Um, or if you think it's healthy, you bring the horse to the slaughterhouse yourself. So you just drive there in your two horse trailer, you hold the horse, they euthanize the horse with the deadbolt. They ask you if they think you can use the meat or whether it's not usable, you give them an opinion. They test the meat. If it tests clean, you get paid for it. If it tests so there's chemicals, you pay them. Um, I don't know what they do with the chemical meat, um, but to me, there's no difference between a dead bull and a needle in the neck as far as youth euthanizing a horse. It's the same thing. And I would rather hold my horse and see it euthanized. You know? They don't have unwanted horses in Holland. They don't have these massive amount of horses that are starving and unwanted, and everybody has to donate money just to feed them or find them. They just don't have them because you have that out. Nobody's making money with horse meat, but it's an outlet, and it's an outlet that's right there. To me, the worst thing is to see your horse get on a trailer with 30 other horses, be abused while it goes to Canada or Mexico. In Canada, it's gonna be handled like a meat animal, but at least it's gonna be relatively okay, not really okay. In Mexico, it's gonna be handled like something that has no value whatsoever. So that part of it becomes horrific, you know? So would you say if there was more slaughter in the U.S., it would probably be a lot more regulated than it right. is in America? Right, it would be a lot more regulated. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could do it correctly. And, you know, I euthanize. If I have a lesson horse that is just too old, I don't want to see that horse leave because the person who adopts it is going to get divorced. And then they're going to have to give the horse to their friend and then they're going to get sick and they have to give the horse to their friend. Next thing you know, the horse is at a slaughter auction. And I've seen it happen a lot. So I try not to find these fictitious homes. That horse has served its whole life. It's just really old. I pay to euthanize. And then, so you're looking at oftentimes anywhere from a three to $700 bill to get that done. But I figured I owe the horse that. When I bred thoroughbreds, the hardest horse to deal with is that bear and brood Right? A thoroughbred mare who no longer gets in full has zero value. And what do you do with it? I don't want to pretend it's something good is going to happen. In other words, this is a 17-year-old horse that's healthy, but he can't get in full. It's not going to be a riding horse at that point. And um, so I euthanize it. I pay the three to $700 when I euthanize it on my farm. I don't want to see it go down the road. But I have euthanized a healthy animal. So everybody's got to wrestle with that. But if I kept all the mares, if everybody kept all the old mares, they'd have more old, non-productive mares than they have productive mares eventually. Do you ever have like a favorite horse come in when you're at the track or like at the barn? Sure. Got to come in and just be involved in it, you mean? Yeah, like do you have one that you've never seen? Yeah, I mean, you get attached to all of them. I mean, any, anything you're working with for that long a period of time, they all kind of play their own role. You know, it's not always the most famous ones. How long on average do your horses live? Nowadays, I think the upper 20s. You know, and when I was your age, they lived to like 21 to 23. But the healthcare has gotten so much better through the years that um, now it's not uncommon. But they do increase their useful life. Like we'll have less horses up there 20 to 23 years old. It used to be very, very rare. But at some point, they're just old. And that age, when they're not useful to when they actually are gonna die, is a fairly long period of time. So I have a lot of friends that are vets, and I said, you mean, you SOBs, you've increased the geriatric life of the horse. That's really what they've done. They've created a geriatric clientele base, and it's their wealthiest clientele base. That's really where they make their money. Of course, all they were trying to do is take good care of horses, but they've created nursing home horses. And that becomes kind of an issue. So the plot one of the farms in this town, though, getting her to be nice earlier this week at 40 months old. Oh, she's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have a friend who has a Morgan. She retired it. She bought another horse, thinking I won't have to board two because it's going to get old and die. And it's 
it's been like seven years. So how close is that old like can you like not really. No more than your grandfather can go out and chop a little wood. Yeah, the older they get, a little less, you know, but they need the outlaw. You know, like their digestive system is only designed to work in motion. So, um, so we just need the outlaw. And then we'll want more sensory way to respond to it, right? And then, um, I think you could, like, you could mention the, the thoroughbred retirement when it comes to that. There's, um, we went to, I've never met this semester, but, a, was it a thoroughbred? It was a thoroughbred pond? Where? Um, old friends. Old friends, yeah. Yeah, that's just for thoroughbreds, yeah. Yeah, so they take in their non for profit place and they take in horses right off the track. And they go out. They're on the pasture 24 7, 365. They don't come in at all. So until the day they, they pass, they're outside. Yeah, but most of the time they're with like a partner to get another horse or something. So it's really cool. I mean, one of the things about horses is you're producing them to go do something with them, and then they're not going to be useful at some point. The percentage of horses that go to slaughter, the race horses are not the high percentage. It's the pleasure horses that are the high percentage. The three slaughterhouses that were left in the country before they closed were all in Texas. Why was that? Slaughterhouse is going to be where the horses need to be slaughtered, right? So they were quarter horses. I don't want to pick on Miss Miss Victoria too much, but they were quarter horses going to the slaughterhouse. You know? So, uh, uh, but there's a lot of horses out there. But you know, when you watch, it's horrifying. Horses that do race get hurt. I mean, have you read about Santa Anita? Yeah, and a horse got hurt just in the Breeders' Cup. And uh, um, though these race tracks will also go to uh, statistically, it'll happen, you end up with a perfect storm, but they'll go through a rash of breakdowns. Saratoga did, a number of years ago, went through a rash of breakdowns. And you really, it's very hard to put your finger on the actual cause. They ramp up the pre-vetting before races, they tighten up on the medication, they test the racing surface every day, they try to do, do the diligence, but they kind of go through that little rash of breakdowns. But while that's going on, that's that's pretty horrible. So what's the stereotype that they draw to horses? Like you at the race like If you're going to drug a racehorse, you're going to uh, mask pain. Right? If you're going to drug a show horse, you might mask pain, but you're probably going to mask the horse being too up, you know, too hard, too fresh. You're going to tranquilize. You might mask pain, but you also may, may tranquilize. Racehorse, you're just masking pain. So they control the medication in the racehorse world much more than the horse show world. Because again, when those horses get hurt in the horse show world, they're not at the point of breaking their bones, right? So if you're masking a little pain with them, not so good, but they're not gonna die, right? If you're masking pain with a racehorse, but that's the idea, where they're masking pain and they're still, the chemists are staying ahead of the testers and they have a system and it doesn't get tested. So, um, but uh, you guys haven't been nearly hard enough. Um, this article, uh, the first one I put on top on purpose, um, this was in the Washington Post. Washington Post, I mean, to me, that's one of the top two newspapers ever in the country. New York Times, Washington Post. New York Times is brutal about racing, absolutely brutal. Washington Post, they don't put so much in, but you don't get an article on the front page of the Washington Post or on the web, you know, and be nobody. You know, now a lot of his information is it's not quite on target, and it doesn't give you the best overall picture, but it's not completely wrong. It's not completely wrong. Sore ankle, twisted ankle, versus yeah, breakdown. You just can't. You're no longer an athlete. So I 
Oh. Oh. There's been a lot on social media about like the Santa Anita track and they should shut it down. What do you think about that? Should they shut it down? I don't think it's possible to shut it down. And it's one of the higher quality racetracks. Um, but um, I still think they can just keep doing a better job. But unfortunately, economics of an industry force things too. One of the <coughs> one of the biggest stress factors for breaking horses down is the population at the racetrack. If there aren't enough horses to fill the races, the only way the racetrack makes money is by filling races so folks can bet. If they're not at every time uh, if you have a five horse field of horses, people are gonna bet less than if you have an eight horse field. They have better they have better odds the more horses in the race. So as soon as the race is getting smaller number, people bet less. So then the train, the race tracks put pressure on the trainers to run their horses more often. Okay? And, uh, and it's very hard. Now they control whether you have stalls there or not. So it's very hard, but it's, if you have a shortage of horses, then there's pressure to run those horses more and, and to fill races. Uh, so. You've got to have just a number to say, well, generally speaking, people get sick and die. Generally speaking, horses get sick and die. And so that's already a percentage. That's your base percentage. But then what happens on top of that? You know, that's the thing. Uh, so the more human articles I put in there is just to say that there are people working with horses. You know, the abuses, I, I mean, there are issues very much so at the racetrack. And some of the racetrack, Horsemanship is just horrible. It's horrible. Typically, not always, the lower level you go, the worse the horsemanship. At Belmont Park, at a higher level, there are some terrible horse people there. Terrible horse people there. At Finger Lakes, at a lower level, there are some very good horse people there. So you can't just blanket it, but generally speaking, it's going to be a bit different. Um, and the horsemanship skill, um, you know, because, in other words, racing is not a horsemanship optional sport. You either do a very good job or you don't do it. I can go into a hunter ring and jump around a three foot course and do it badly. Nobody cares for the wear. You know, the horse is like, geez, he hit me in the mouth six times when I went over a jump. But he eats his oats up anyway at the end of the day. You do it badly on the racing and the horse gets hurt. The abuses that I saw that I thought were the most profound were actually on the jockeys. A jockey's life is a horrible, miserable existence. And the top 1% of the jockeys make millions and millions of dollars. And they're top, top, top athletes. Um, but people who become jockeys are oftentimes destitute. Um, in Ireland, they scoop these kids off the street and they bring them to the Irish racing school. The family already has 11 children. They didn't actually realize that one's gone, you know, and uh, um, or they send money back. You know, a lot of the jockeys in the, that are U.S. were born in the U.S. They came from Cajun country, and they're barefoot, and they were running in these bush races on quarter horses, literally in the bush. So, and uh, um, the jockeys come through relatively poor environments. They're hoping to make it, and then the racetrack and the trainers take advantage of. And uh, again, the talented ones make it, the less talented ones don't. But in the meantime, you know, it's, uh, they have to keep their weight where it needs to be, which is kind of an inhumane number. And um, uh, so they, they throw up every day. They throw up every single day. In the jockey's room, there's a place to do that. You know, and uh, they're dehydrated. You know, it's just a, not a healthy lifestyle. And they get hurt. When that horse gets hurt, goes down, the jockey gets the worst of it. Have you ever, like, in any of the race tracks you've been to, like, uh, have you ever seen, like, one of those cases where, like, someone killed off a high-insurance horse? 
No. Never? No, never. That's a horse show thing. That's a horse show thing. They're doing horse shows all the time. But not at the Ritz Carlton. You know, you know, I, yeah, I can't say never, but uh, that's kind of a moody thing. Um, uh, so do you do, you can sure race horses for mortality, meaning that if they do die, you can collect, but the value is, is there and uh, and for the most part, you know, I've never seen it. I heard it, I heard it happen once, very, very early in my career, and I've never seen it. So there are a lot of atrocities, but that's not one that horse show will get, yeah, that's there. Could you see yourself in any, like when you were first starting out with it, could you ever see yourself doing somewhere different instead of breeding or like on the racetrack, do you ever want to do something else? Yeah, well, I'm in a wide variety, but I like show jumping, I like eventing, I like harness sanitation, I like breeding racehorses, I like galloping racehorses, but it's all different. Definitely wouldn't be a veterinarian. Who wants to be a veterinarian? Oh my God. Quarter of a million dollars. 30 grand a year when you get out. Seven days a week. You have to work with horse owners. You have to pass organic chemistry. Um, I guess I'll ask Mr. Joy just to send out a little survey about what your attitudes about racing are. We have to make up some questions or something. Um, and uh, um, and again, don't think, I'm not selling racing. Don't think, I like the horse. I do enjoy the sport when it's done well. There are many times it's done terribly. Um, and, uh, um, but, uh, uh, so don't you know? Don't put your name on it. In other words, we'll send a survey out without your name, and uh, but you're not going to insult me. That's for sure. And uh, hopefully there will be opinions all over the board in it. You know, um, it, uh, we have just one more minute. We have just one more minute. If you feel like it, just to look. Around. I don't know exactly how you would find it. Um, I could give you some clues to search. But a couple years ago, Peta, who was very smart, they're very, very very smart. They um, they knew one of the top trainers, one of the mega trainers, was going to come up with eligibility to the Hall of Fame, and um, they wanted to get more press that way. So the year before that was going to happen, they had a young woman infiltrate his operation. She got hired there. Um, she became the girlfriend of his main assistant trainer, which meant she was in around every conversation possible. And she recorded things, um, videotaped things. Most of it was just voice. Some of it was visual. And um, and then they took, now you're talking about a huge stable. There's a lot going on, a lot of stress in the larger stables. And, um, but they took all the information that they had. And one of the worst parts was her boyfriend, the assistant trainer, used the F word just naturally as every third word. I mean, he did not, if his sentence had six words in it, it was in there twice, you know. So he was an unappealing kind of person to listen to. And then he was a very straight up person too, just said things as they were. <coughs> and he had a lot of stress. So they took all that information, they changed it all around. They put different language with different video. Um, and But they had a lot of damaging info. It's just they got greedy. So they moved it around so it was horribly damaging. But the reality was it was completely manipulated to the point that it was false. So he got, his nomination came up, he was tabled from being voted on into the Hall of Fame for a year. They investigated that investigation and they found out that you know, it was completely manipulated. They sued PETA and won you know, for defamation, which was great, you know. To me, it was kind of silly because Peter had good information. But and they, you know, give credit to the young woman. She gave a year of her life, sold her soul, gave a year of her life, and you know, <laughs> whatever. But she, they did get the inside scoop. It's just then they had to change it all. So, but I was glad that they sued him, and I was glad that they won. But 
and the guy's now in the Hall of Fame. A year later, he got nominated again. Yeah, so. Right. Well, sorry to keep you guys the whole time. Mine almost did. I got a bunch of emails yeah. from. Well, I felt so like, click on this. Sign up for a job yep. Where, but over the summer. Yep. Almost. How many pages is the paper? Six to eight. Okay. I was just making we sure. We thought it was eight to ten. <laughs> yeah. I changed. Last year I had an eight to ten. That's why I, I saw. Because I saw eight. the dates were different. Like I don't know if, if this is not updated. So I wanted to make sure. It, it's question. updated now. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Oh, you printed the copy. It was probably the old one. Thank you, you too. Well, thank you very much for coming in. It's okay. It was very good. I learned a lot. These are I was going to give you. I wrote down like three pages of notes as well. I wish you know. I, um,